I'm going to call this meeting to order. This is the Board of Education's work session um, for May 3rd, 2023. I would remind you that this is a work session. We will take no action. So a quorum is not necessary, even though we have one here. We have people that will be absent today. Um, please give us feedback. Let us know. We're still working through some things here. And we're trying to get as many things uh, that do not require action removed from our regular meeting, which is next Wednesday, to this work meeting. Things like presentation, um, areas where we're gaining information from people that would normally, you should have been here. My first meeting lasted till midnight. There's some people that say my first meeting lasted two days. It just lasted till after midnight. That was it. But we're trying to avoid that at all costs. So um, again, if you want to speak, there is a sign up out in the main hall there for audience communications. And we'll recognize that here in a little bit. Uh, Mrs. Baldwin, could we have a roll call, please? Yes. Good evening, Mr. Chair, trustees. Beth Baer. Mary Alice Bruce. Here. Steve Gosar. Here. Janice Marshall. Nate Martin. Here. Emily Siegel Stanton. Here. Kim Sorensen. Here. Alex Christine. Carrie Murphy. Here. Six present. Thank you. Item number two is student employee recognitions. This is probably the coolest thing that that some that some board started a long time ago that we're glad to continue. Uh, we have FFA national finalists here with us tonight and at least one of their sponsors. I see Mrs. Kunkel, Mr. Coxbill, are you here? Um, if you two wanna come up and introduce your people and tell us a little bit about your national finalists. Thank you. So yeah, we just returned from state FFA convention, what, two weeks ago, I believe. We compete against 52 other chapters in the state. Um, we had a lot of teams placed really well. We ended up with two state champion teams, which were our ag mechanics team and chapter of conduct meeting or conduct of chapter meetings team, which is a freshman crew. We do have a few missing, a couple are sick and one's in Florida, but I will let the kids introduce themselves and talk about their contests. My name is uh, Keegan Aurelius, and uh, I was on the Ag Mechanics team this year. Uh, through that contest, we go through a individual test, which covers basic knowledge of uh, ranch work and machinery. Uh, there's a welding portion where we uh, weld whatever has been set in front of us. Uh, there's a small gas engine portion mm -hmm. where we identify parts and figure out what's missing or measure tolerances on the on the uh, engines themselves. Uh, there's the electrical portion where we either wire up AC power, which is your standard house wiring, or uh, DC, which is your vehicle electrical stuff. Um, I'm forgetting something. Uh, there's also the team test. Team test. Um, that is where the four of our uh, four of our members get together and actually figure out a problem with the four of us putting our minds together and working as a group. Thank you. And I'm Marshall Olson. I was also on the state mechanics team. Uh, I'll mention too before Marshall walks away, he was actually the high individual in the whole contest and walked away with over $8,000 worth of college scholarships to both the uh, wow. you know, L triple C and biotech. So he did a really good job. So these conduct kids, um, before I let them talk about themselves, Riley Lake was actually the high individual on the floor in the contest. And then Wyatt Strain was the high individual on the test. And we also had the high team test. But Hi, so like you said, my name is Riley. And so in our conduct chapter of meetings contest, it's only for freshmen and 
eighth graders, I guess. Um, so we take a 25 question test about like rules and stuff of parliamentary procedure. And then basically we run a mock meeting. And so Jim is our chair. And so then all of us are on the floor debating and then we just answer questions after that. Yeah. I'm Jim Cox, Bill, I'm the chair. My name is Wyatt Strain, I'm the reporter. I'm Shanna Stinson and I was the secretary. I'm Trenton Rogers and I was the sentinel. I'm James Bosick and I was the treasurer. Um, I'm Mrs. Kunkel, I'm the other ag teacher and FFA sponsor and these 11 students and Three of us adults will be traveling to the National FFA Convention to compete against the other states in October. And so our students will do some fundraising to get that opportunity. But uh, we just thank the board for supporting CTE and FFA and AG and appreciate everything you do for our school district. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming in. Riley, are you available to be hired by the board chair as a parliamentarian? <laughs> there are times I need lots of help, but... I could just figure out how to do that. Thank you so much for coming in and congratulations. Um, being national finalists is awesome. Thank you so much. We also have um, Neil Summers from Laramie High School. Is Neil here? Right there, Neil. Neil received a, a good sportsmanship award from the Wyoming High School Activities Association. Uh, Dr. Goldhart, would you like me to read this or do you want? Um, Neil, come on. Up. Come on up. I'm going to read to you here. This was a letter addressed from Ron Laird, the commissioner of the Wyoming High School Activities Association. Uh, to your principal, Mr. George, it says, as per recommendation from the game officials, I'm pleased to present Neil Summers with the enclosed Wyoming High School Activities Association. Good Sportsmanship Award for his exemplary conduct and good sportsmanship shown during the East versus Laramie basketball game held March 4th, 2023. Sportsmanship is the goal that all of our coaches and athletes should have as they participate in activities. I'm pleased to hear that your students and coaches understand the true meaning of participation. Please extend my appreciation and congratulations to Neil for joining the ride by demonstrating respect, integrity, dedication, and encouragement. Sincerely, Ron Laird, Commissioner of the Wyoming High School Activity Association. Congratulations and thank you so much for representing your school and our district in such a positive way. Thank you. Did you want to say anything? <laughs> well, we'll give you the mic and okay, thank you so much for coming. It is also my pleasure to introduce Audrey Young. There she is. Audrey is a U.S., a United States presidential scholar semifinalist. If, um, you need to read the criteria to know that we are in the presence of greatness there. And uh, thank you so much for coming and congratulations. Did you have anything to say about the process? Or Yeah, I, I'd love to. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for inviting me here, as well as all the hard work you do to ensure that uh, the students in our school district have access to high quality education. Thank you so much. It's a great honor to be here. I just have a few words to thank the people uh, that got me to where I am today. I'd like to thank my family, um, to my mom, who's always stood by me uh, through the darkest times of my high school career, uh, both in like academically and interpersonally. She has always picked me up and told me I can do it. Um, to my father, who has been an incredible role model all my life, and my little brother, who's eight years old. He's just a ball of sunshine. Um, but most of all, I'd like to thank the teachers at LHS because 
I think that this award is less of a reflection on me than it is a reflection on the incredible, incredible teachers and staff that we have at Laramie High School. So um, I'd like to thank every single teacher that I've ever had in a class, um, but some of the most influential have been Miss Whitney Martin, uh, who I nominated for the Presidential Scholars uh, Teachers Award, uh, Mr. Street, Ms. Halsey, Profe Howard, Mr. Plum, and Ms. Chamberlain. They have taught me not only how to be a better student, but first and foremost, how to be a good person and uh, a good member of society. So I would not be here without them today. And thank you so much for all you've done for me. Audrey, thank you so much. We're very proud of you and your efforts and, and congratulations for representing our school and, and district so well. Audience communications, Ms. Baldwin, do we have any audience communications tonight? We have one, Mariah Learned, please. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, Mariah Learned, ACEA co-president, currently not for very much longer, so you won't be hearing from me during uh, public comment, um, probably much more. Uh, I just wanted to visit a little bit. I know that you have this huge decision with insurance coming, and we have had, I've had countless classified staff reach out to me, afraid to come, afraid to speak out. They don't have continuing contract. They don't have that, that layer of security. And many of them are uncomfortable coming and speaking. And I just wanted to um, pass along some of their concerns. One being that every employee will be giving up their life insurance policy. But according to the presentation last week, the funds that will be saved, that $250,000 will be used to incentivize the high deductible plan. So not everybody will be seeing the same amount of benefit from that lost benefit. Many of our classified employees cannot afford to move to that $3,500 deductible plan. It's a huge risk for them. They're already working two jobs, three jobs, and to be able to move to that high deductible, that means putting out $7,500 before you get any coinsurance. Our classified employees cannot afford to do that. They also cannot afford to then put an additional $9,000 in an HSA. On top of that, the loss of their life insurance policy means that if they want to keep that, and many of them communicated both at meet and confer and in other meetings that that is important to them, it's something they've been counting on, they now have to pay for that benefit. So that's an, another cost out of their pocket. It will impact everybody, but it disproportionately does affect our classified employees. And I know that working three and four jobs is not something they can continue to do. It doesn't allow them to be with their families. It doesn't allow them to do their best work here when they're exhausted. I don't have the answer, but I wanted to put this forward. These are the concerns that are coming to us. Even a $2,500 deductible plan is going to be an incredible um, burden for them. And we are going to end up in the exact same place next year. Everybody currently on that $1,000 plan that we're overspending, many of them are talking about going to that $1,500 plan. And so we're going to overspend there again next year. I don't have the answers. Again, um, I appreciate that you have an incredibly difficult decision and many more in front of you. Thank you for your consideration, especially for our classified employees. This is going to hurt them the most. Ms. Learned, before you sit down, uh, are you a you're a member of the Meet and Confer Committee? Yes, I am. Um, are you on the, do you sit in on the Finance Committee as well? I've been to a few, but then there was some information that I was probably not supposed to be privy to, so I was not allowed to attend those meetings. Every time you get up and speak, I, I wish I had it on tape so I could listen to it again and again. Would you make sure that the people on this board um, get a copy or hear through committees your concerns again? Absolutely. We'll be at meet and confer on Monday. Um, I would expect that we'll be seeing the final 
um, offer in terms of what insurance looks like right now, not knowing what budget really entails and what those audits will come back with. And, um, but yes, I will absolutely share those. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Trustee Stan. Sorry, I don't know when is the right time for us to ask more questions about some of this information. We don't usually ask questions of those who do audience communications. I, I will entertain a question since you started. Thank you, not directly toward Ms. Learned. Thank you for that information. But I too am concerned about not some of the savings that we're gonna make from these changes being funneled to incentivize only certain tiers of the health insurance plan. Just keeping in mind employees who have the chronic health conditions and need to be seen and need medications, they can't defer these things. Um, and so I'd like to see that relief spread across all the tiers of health insurance for people in, in a squeeze. You know, that a $3,500 deductible is huge, right? That means you're paying $3,500 for every service to the doctor. Now, a young person who has no health insurance, right? It's like gambling or no health in issues might choose that because they're like, oh, I never go to the doctor. That's cool. But some of our employees are facing chronic health conditions and being incentivized only at that tier is, is tough on those folks who have to have medical services early in the year. Is that clear? And I don't know I, I'm unclear on where the wiggle room is, whether we can change some of how that distribution is being used. I'm just saying that. I would say, Trustee Stanton, we have a budget update, which is agenda item number five. If we have not answered your question or adequately um, acknowledged it, would you please state it again for us? And Ms. Learned, we may ask you a question or two again. Thank you. Again, this is a meeting where we will not take action, but I think it behooves us to get information from as many different places and people willing to give it as possible. Um, with that said, I'm, I'm going to move on to number four, which is the Rock River presentation. And I will state right up front in, in our desire to change the format of our meetings, the first person that we had to contact was Principal Amphison and go, would you be ready to present Wednesday? I think you got to call Monday instead of next Wednesday. And, and I think if I remember the answer that I can repeat was, sure. <laughs> okay, I, I believe it. And so here she is on like 48 hour notice to do a school presentation to the Board of Education. It, it, thank it, you so much. Yeah, it was a good thing I was ready a week ago. So thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Um, typically we have somebody that would start out with the pledge. So what we have is I recorded. Every morning we do the pledge at Rock River. And these three that you see in the picture there are three future Longhorns. They are actually kids of employees in our building. And um, they're currently in our daycare slash preschool. And they will, if you want to stand up, they can lead us in the pledge tonight. <laughs> and it does, it, you might want to go all the way back. It's kind of, it misses the beginning a little bit, Sean, but they were a little fast before Tammy hit record. And then that picture right there is priceless. The one that's just running, his name is Cash, and we call him Cash the Flash because he's always running. So, or I call him Cash the Flash. But anyway, thanks for playing that, Sean. Um, so we can get started. I do have two people with me here that uh, were kind enough to join me and help me out. Mr. Torbert, he's our sixth grade teacher out at the Rock, and Megan Plant is our counselor out there, and they have a couple of slides. I'm gonna move this. When I got up here and I want you guys to do the same. So go ahead. So our first slide, that's a shot of our, there's our mission and vision. Um, that picture right there was one of our beginning of the year pep assemblies. So that's our student body sitting in our gym. That's all the kindergartners and preschoolers actually through 12th grade. And they're actually sitting with their groups um, so that when we do our spirits 
spirit cheers and all that stuff. They're kind of cohorted up, but that's a snapshot of that's us right there in the, in the first picture. Here's a breakdown of, of who we are. Sorry, that's a little bit dim and hard to see, but you can see our enrollment has grown over the last three years. <laughs> Sean's getting click happy over there. There we go. No, it doesn't matter. It's just dim. Um, anyway, you can see our enrollment has has grown over the last three years, and I did a breakdown of our demographics there for you. Um, so we're excited that every year we seem to to be gaining a few more. Typically, when we gain students, we're gaining like in fourth and fifth grade on up. Um, our lower numbers are at the younger younger ages, which makes sense. I mean, it's a little harder. Parents might probably feel like, oh, it's a long bus ride. Um, we get a lot of sixth graders when it's time to go to the middle school and they still kind of want that elementary feel and they come out to us out there. And then a lot of times they fall in love with it out there. So they stay with us. Go ahead. Um, here's a picture. So what I did is I broke it down because typically, you know, we're just Rock River School, but we are three schools within one. We have an elementary, a junior high and a high school. So I'll start out with our elementary. Um, in those pictures right there, we have... A picture on the left is a picture of our what we call books for breakfast. It's one of our family um, title one family nights. We do them in the morning, too. We'll talk a little bit about that more later. In the middle, we hosted a STEM night this year where we had members of the UW Rural Teacher Corps come out. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And then that picture on the right, that's that's a continuation from the picture number one. That's a picture of our second and third graders, and, and they won the spirit stick. They had the loudest cheer when we were doing our contest, and it's it's quite the stick. It's a plunger, and they were really proud that they won that plunger, and they just, they hoisted that thing in the air, and they were like, yeah. So that, that's that's our little elementary. So here's a little bit about our elementary. We are school-wide Title I. I have a snapshot of our data over there. And you'll notice that the grade levels are taken out just so that you don't know which grade level is what. But the colors, one way we look at data is to follow a cohort. And we do have a lot of turnover at Rock River. So it is kind of hard to call a cohort a cohort when we gain and lose different human beings within that grade level. But at the same time, it's important to follow it to see where we're meeting proficiency and where we may not be. So it's one way that we take a look at data. We also break it down a little bit further, and I'll show you that later in another slide. Some of the things that we do in our elementary, uh, we are school-wide Title I. We have been working with Teton Science School this year. We are a place-based network school. We were actually adopted by National Geographic. They took us on and gave us a grant and said, would you like to do this? And we were, and I went to the team because I thought, gosh, you guys have new math curriculum. You're doing all this stuff with your instructional facilitator. And they were like, yeah, let's do it. And so we we jumped on board and, and our teacher Fridays, that's what they've been doing. They've had four teacher Fridays where they've worked a full Friday with a coach from Teton Science School on implementing the, the place space network. And Jeff will talk more about that. He's our he's our network contact from them. Um, so first year out at Rock River and we already put him to work with that. But um, it's been really cool that they took that on something about us that is unique. It, we have that four day week and it comes in really handy for us because we are able to then do things like that kind of PD and dedicate time and looking at data, whether it be science, whether it be math, all those things, we spend a lot of time. And I will say our teachers work very hard on those Fridays. Um, you know, a perception might be, oh, you get those Fridays off. They don't, they're working their tails off and I couldn't be prouder. Um, Capturing kids' hearts, we have been working for them for or working with them for three years. And we've implemented a lot of that framework over the course of three years, K-12. And again, we'll we'll talk a little deeper about that later. Our breakdown of our classrooms. <clears throat> uh, we are a kindergarten first combo, second, third combo, fourth, fifth. And then this year we put sixth grade on its island on an island. And we did that for a reason. It was a large group of kids. And we also thought, you know to kind of have a, a sort of middle school feel and let them have a little bit of that time independently as a, as a cohort to work on those core subjects and sort of ease into the junior high um, mindset, I guess. And it's worked out really well. And so next year, we're actually going to evolve that a little bit. And the sixth graders are going to go with the seventh grade to electives in that schedule too. So 
that's like the next phase of that. And then meanwhile, while they're doing that, Mr. Torbert will be able to help out with flooding the fifth grade and really diversifying some of, of our needs there. That's a high needs group in instruction in ELA and math, math in particular. Um, so we're going to do some creative things there with that cohort next year. And we're excited because that's it'll be almost a transitional middle school for them because they'll get to feel that. What is it like to transition um, and yet still have home base in their elementary? So we're excited to see what that's going to look like next year. So our family engagement nights um, every year, we have to do two, one dedicated to math, one de de dedicated to reading. We've done our reading one. We're going to do math in the morning on Monday next week. We surveyed our parents and we asked them what times work best for you. And what came back, we get more participation when we do it before school than we do in the evenings. And, and that was what the parents reflected back to us. So this year we've done two in the morning, or we will do another one, but the two will be in the morning. And then the STEM one was in the evening. And we paired that up with a concert and we had excellent turnout for that. So it's been, it, it's kind of one of those, who, who's going to show up and how many, and we've had really good numbers this, the last two years. So we're, we're pleased with that. Um, again, working with the rural teacher corps was awesome. Those, those future teachers came out and ran science groups with our teachers. Um, parents, kids had a blast and they were creating things and testing things in the gym. And it was an hour and a half that we thought was going to be too long and they loved it. So it was a great night. And now I'll go ahead and let Mr. Torbert talk a little bit about what we're doing with our place-based learning. All right, as uh, Ms. Hamilton said, I'm the network advocate with TSS and um, really with the place-based or, or network, um, entails is we are a collaborative network of schools. They're all K to K through 12 schools throughout the whole country. Um, I know in my group that I meet with, there's there's teachers from Missouri, from Canada, from Idaho, from Washington State, from California. Um, and we're able to use that connection and that collaboration to expand upon our learning within our classroom, which is local, who we are here in Albany County, to the global, what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, and part of uh, the, the process we've used this year, um, we use what they call the place triangle. So we look at all of our, our curriculum that we're gonna present to the kids in this triangle where we're, we're using ecology, the economy, and the culture. In, in our place, and our place happens to be Albany County, Wyoming. And so we try to decide what are we, what we're doing in the classroom or what we're doing, um, how's it affecting one of those three areas within our place? And what can we do to be good stewards in those three areas in our place? Um, and so in, with that, and as we've, we've went through our curriculum and, and made some changes that make it more relevant for kids here in Wyoming, um, I know like our kindergarten class, one of their um, science lessons was push versus pull and they use tugboats. It's a great lesson, but not a lot of kids in Wyoming know a lot about tugboats. So we modified it with trains. And I know um, Miss Nichols took her kids out and they actually used the sled when we had a lot of snow and showed when you push on this side of the sled, it pivots this way, just like the lesson did with the tugboats, but making it relevant to our kids here so that it actually meant something to them. And with those small changes, which really isn't changing our curriculum, we're just changing our delivery method. I've noticed within my classroom week one to just this last week, student engagement has went through the roof. Kids are excited about science. I'm asked, we try to get outside and, and, and do our much learning out in nature around the school when weather allows as much as we can. And like now that the weather's turning nice, it's every day in the morning. Can we go outside today? Can we go learn out by the trees today? Can we go journal out in the baseball field today? So we went out one day this week and the kids sat there and journaled for 30 minutes. And to try to get them to do 30 minutes of writing in the classroom is like pulling teeth. But just that being in their place creates this high level engagement that you can't replicate by showing a video on a smart board. So. 
Um, go on. And then the other thing I'm going to talk about is our CKH and our social emotional learning. The, the picture, the lower picture there that says L, one thing we do school wide is every classroom creates a social contract. Um, and it's not just us teachers and staff creating that contract, the kids help us produce that contract in each classroom. Um, and with them creating that, and we use the acronym ELK, and it's uh, effort, um, listening, and kindness. And the kids within my classroom, what I did is we, we talked about what was effort, what was listening, what was kindness. And all the kids wrote down five or six things that they thought effort was, what they thought listening was, what they thought kindness was. And then we went through um, and we found all the repeats and we, we filtered those out. And then we came up with our list of what our social contract in our classroom was going to look like, um, how were all of us going to show effort, how were all of us going to listen, and how all, were all of us going to be kind um, to the people around us. And uh, I think having that student buy-in has been huge on, it's not my rule that I gave you to do this. You're the ones that came up with it. So it's, are you being true to yourself? These are your rules. Um, the other thing I, I've, I've really enjoyed um, with CKH, there's a word of the month. Um, this past April, our word happened to be perseverance. I, I have a student in my classroom very, very, very shy student. Um, struggles to get in front of anybody, especially if it involves speaking. Um, even even in outside the classroom with things like extracurricular activities, sometimes she would choose to sit out and not participate because it was just too scary to be in front of people. Um, I use that word of our month, knowing that we had a big science presentation everybody had to give in class. And, and I, I push that word perseverance all month. And last week, this particular student stood up in front of the class, gave a phenomenal presentation. Um, one of the best presentations I've ever had to give a, a student in sixth grade give. And like, there was no care in the world and it didn't bother her to be up there. And I, and I attribute that to the lessons we do through our CKH, um, teaching the skills kids can use to show perseverance. Um, to show integrity and, and all the other words that we've used throughout the year. Um, so it's just been a great, great um, tool to use um, that I've been learning right along with the kids, as Ms. Mm -hmm. Edmondson said, being my first year out there. So it's been great to see. Along with that, um, we also incorporate the CKH uh, values with our staff celebrations. So we do a lot of staff celebrations, either we have teachers of the month that follow the same word, or about midway through the year, we adopted from Debbie her fish philosophy, and I'll, I'll show you a picture of that later on. We we have little traveling trophies that go to different teachers per month too, that we can share with each other. Um, and then we do second step guidance, kindergarten through sixth grade, and that's something that Megan teaches in her guidance classes at, for our social emotional learning. And then we go to junior high. So our junior high is seventh and eighth grade and they're in their own cohorts. Um, they have electives, they get every elective. The junior high kids in our building, they really don't get choice because <laughs> we want to expose them to everything for those two years to give them a taste of a little bit of everything so that when they do get to high school and then they can choose, they might have an interest that they didn't know they had because we, we kind of made them do you know, family and consumer science, ag, art, music, PE, and Spanish. And so we've noticed that that does help them get that exposure before they make those decisions when they get older into what they want to go into. We do an eighth grade unit of study for Hathaway. Megan does that with the eighth graders as well. And then we offer activities and athletics in our junior high. And our junior high also has the CKH framework in their advisory classes. Go ahead, Sean. <clears throat> so here's a little snapshot of our YTOP data with seventh and eighth grade. And you can see we, we've experienced some growth there and we're pretty excited about that. Um, our teacher Fridays in the secondary level, seven through 12, works with uh, Mike McManaman. He is contracted with us as an outside consultant. 
like a facilitator. And the work that they've been doing on Teacher Fridays has been pretty intense. They've been going through looking at district assessments, curriculum, as well as our data. And then what can we do next? Um, that's something that we've been working on for two years now, and we're starting to really see the, the benefits of that work. And so it's it's been really neat to see it pay off. Our kids are showing that they are capable. And, and so we're excited to keep doing that. And again, just like the elementary teachers, our secondary teachers work very hard on those Fridays um, to get the curriculum and assessments aligned. So some of the electives and extracurricular activities, we have a couple of pictures up there. The first one, cross country we do. Uh, we have a quite a few runners in cross country and track now and in the seventh and eighth grade. And then there's a snapshot of our Christmas concert this year. Almost every junior high student is involved in something, whether it be a sport or a club. 94% of them are, are in at least one thing, which is pretty remarkable. That means that they are most all are stepping out of their comfort zone and participating in something. And that's that's exciting. Um, here's a picture of so the one on the bottom left, at the beginning of the year, what we do with our older kids is we take the, the advisory groups into the gym and we ask them four key questions that come out of the Capturing Kids Hearts framework. And one of them, that little snapshot, and you can't really tell it is a longhorn, but it kind of faded. But it's a question of how do you think teachers want to be treated? And they wrote down the words and what they thought. And then we created you know, little, little posters of, of what they came up with. And those are our values. Like we, they know teachers, that first word right there that stands out respectfully, they know that's how teachers want to be treated. And then coincidentally, that's what came up on theirs. How do you want to be treated? And so we, we, we have those that they have created and that they can have that buy-in too. In advisory, we do have time to go over CKH activities. One thing that they do, it's called good things, share good things. Just tell me your good thing. What's something good that you did last night? Um, they also go over grades, make a plan for their I and E time. Um, we do have intervention and enrichment built in twice a week in our schedule. And so kids that need extra help or a little bit more time on things, it's built in. Next year, we're going to refine it a little bit more so that we are actually doing some skills practice in there too, but we are still building that. Um, our MTSS team is working very hard on what does that look like in a secondary. And so that's something that, again, is evolving with us out there. And then we jump to high school. So we're out of junior high and we're into high school. So electives here, there's the same ones, but the names change a little bit. They evolve. We, they go into independent art. PE, and then what we call modern band, family, consumer science, ag, and Spanish. We are class 1A in our athletics. And so those are the sports we offer out at Rock River. Uh, and we offer cross country, volleyball, basketball, track, FFA, student council. Those are those WHSAA. Then we do have clubs. We have podcasts, drama, reads, FCA, student interests are considered. And when I say that, I'm going to steal something from LHS. LHS does something called Club Rush every year. We thought that would be a really good idea because podcasts actually came from student interests. Like they wanted something different. And we have a group of students that are really interested in um, the medical field as they're ready to get out of high school. And so our science teachers like, you know, maybe we could have like a health sciences club or anatomy club. And so we're going to propose that out there to see, because she does have a few kids that have approached her about that and she's got some ideas. And so we're going to approach that next year that way. Like, what do you want in a club? Again, when you only have four days in a week though, there's only four lunches to spread that out. And those kids are all in something. So finding the time um, is for some of those kids that like to do everything, they're busy, but that's okay. If they're interested in it, we'll roll with it. Um, there's a picture right there. Uh, we have Cupcake Wars next week. That's a picture of one of our high school students and Cupcake Wars is pretty exciting. It's like Food Network Cupcake Wars if you haven't watched it before, but they make these cupcakes. They have a theme. This year it's about movies. And then we have four judges that go in and taste according to the criteria that Miss Lewis puts together. And so they've been getting ready for Cupcake Wars. I was in there today a little bit getting, I'm not supposed to know though who's making what. So, cause I am supposed to, be non-biased. I'm non-biased anyway. 
Um, that's fun. And in the middle, there's a picture of our band, our band concert this spring. We did a secondary concert separate because our secondary bands, they they have a few more songs. And when we have everything K-12, that concert can be long. And so the secondary kids were like, can we have our own concert where we can kind of showcase ourselves? And so we did a, a spring concert for just secondary and they will also play on Thursday, which you're all invited to. I hope you all got the invite. Um, and they'll they'll play a couple of songs maybe that they played that night as well as some new ones that they've been working on. And the picture on the far right, we had some students this year that actually went to the state choir competition, which was exciting. And so she's in there somewhere. I believe it's your daughter, Mr. Torbert, that's in that picture. <laughs> um, so we we were able to send them to the state competition this year. So activities and athletics, almost all of our junior high and high school, and this is just about the sport. So there's the pick, the number there. 16 out of our 18 junior high kids are in a sport. 30 out of 36 high school students are in a sport. Again, this is where that four day week comes in really handy because what do you do with the six high school kids that are left when it's girls and boys basketball season and they're all in different grade levels? Like, you know, that's freshmen, juniors, seniors, oh, and sophomores. I always forget the sophomores. Not a whole lot left. So having that Friday where those kids can go out and they're not missing a day of school. And even if they were, a teacher's not going to do much with one kid in that class. So it really helps us out in that way. And again, we couldn't be more happy with having that kind of participation. It's exciting that more and more are going out and, and putting themselves out there. Uh, the bottom picture, that's our state basketball girls this year. They qualified for state in basketball and volleyball. And um, they fought real hard in that state tournament. And a couple of them afterwards, they said, yeah. Cokeville had a lot of girls on their bench and I said yes they did but uh, we couldn't be prouder of them for for playing that hard we are the smallest high school when it comes to competition so to make it to a state tournament is huge and I know they'll be there next year as well um, the top that was state cross country they put on a pretty neat show in Ethity for state cross country there's two of our runners there that they came back and they were like that is the coolest thing I've ever been to and then that was our FFA team that was at the same FFA competition that our LHS cohorts were at last time. And then I'll let Ms. Plant talk a little bit about college and career readiness. Hello. Um, this, I've only been at Rock River. This is only my second year. Um, last year, we had one student who was enrolled in dual, a dual enrollment class. Um, this year, we have five. So that's pretty exciting that we've had an increase in that. Um, as you guys probably remember, we're partnering with um, High Altitude Pathways, um, and that has provided some pretty great opportunities for us to go to um, different colleges. We, um, since we started working with them in January, um, we've been able to go to UW and LCCC and had a pretty tailored visit um, specifically for our Rock River students, which you, <clears throat> I wouldn't have the time to set that up, and luckily Colby Gull and Nicholas Jesse did that for us. Um, we attended the Voices in the Field conference that the principal of Whiting put on, which was a really good opportunity for our students to come learn about different professions, um, people who are who are in the, the field working right now. Um, we went to a trades fair today, the Seroptimist um, Club put on a trades fair out at the Albany County Fairgrounds. So students had an opportunity to learn about trades specific to Albany County and the need in our county. Um, so but it's been a really good opportunity to work for, with them. Uh, High Altitude Pathways also came out and did a, um, some workshops with our students about how to talk to people, how to shake hands, how to um, work as a group. So that's been very exciting to, to work with them. We've had um, guest speakers in the last two years. We've had the military come out and talk to our students, um, different colleges like uh, UW and Casper College. And... Um, new this year to our to our school um, are the career internships. 38% of our seniors have an internship scheduled in their day right now. So it's been good experience for them. Um, that picture is at Casper College. That's their nursing program. And they have these pretty incredible dummies that talk and move and have heartbeats and stuff. So that's a student who is listening to their heartbeat. <clears throat> huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a real person now. That's what we have to do. We don't have a nurse out there. We could see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You can go to the next one. 
Um, so this is our ACT composite scores. And as you can see, our mean composite score has gone up in the last three years. So that's very exciting. Our graduation rate is 100%. So, I mean, we had two graduates last year. We have 13, 13. 13 this year. Um, and then just it kind of reviews our dual enrollment for the last three years. I think that's yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you. So this is that other snapshot that I was telling you about. Um, so that's our high school when we look at the whole groups as cohorts. And then off on the right is a random group of, of students there where we track them individually. So we have it broken down into just not only an individual proficiency score, but then also with Mr. McManam and Ms. Mobley, who actually works with our elementary team, they look at what are those standards that the kids did really well on and maybe where did we miss the boat and, and what do we need to go back and supplement or, um, you know, where did we really excel? So we break it down on an individual basis because we're small enough that we can do that. Like that's an advantage of having small sizes where we can say, okay, where are we moving the needle? And then maybe where is the needle stuck? So I thought that that was a, a good graphic for you to see where we're looking at individuals moving across a line. And as we get ready to wrap up, so we have a lot to celebrate at Rock River. We've we've seen a lot of academic growth. We've seen a lot of social emotional growth and, and just and kids thriving in the in that environment out there. Uh, the picture on the right, so that bobblehead doll is Bob Ross. And so Bob stands for the choose your attitude if you're familiar with the fish philosophy of Debbie. And so Bob gets floated around, you know, to the teachers will float it to another colleague or staff member at our staff meetings. And so next Tuesday, Bob will be floated along with, what do we have? Yoda and Elmo and what's the, the last one? Now I'm blank. You haven't got, you've gotten like, you. so you've had three out of the four. Um, so yeah, we have, we have several that float around and, and they get up and they get shared. So we celebrate staff that way. The picture in the middle, is First Lady Gordon. She came out to our building a couple weeks ago. We had some students that donated a lamb to her hunger initiative. And she was like, hey, I typically go visit the schools and that usually happens in the fall, but somehow it was missed. And so she came out in the spring and we said, sure, come on in. And so there she is. And she said, everyone put up the Longhorn sign and they thought that was great because that's what we do out there too. And then in the top left, that's one of our juniors. She actually won an award. She the and Jeff worked with Miss Bennett on this. They did an essay contest through our local VFW on was it what it means to or what does it how do we thank our veterans or what does a veteran mean to you? That's right. Okay. So what does a veteran be a veteran mean to you? And Gentry actually made it to the state level where she took second. She won $1,000 in that competition. And so two of our local veterans came out. And so we had a whole school assembly, brought them out and cheered on them. And they, they awarded her and thanked her. It was an amazing essay. It was really remarkable. So that was something to celebrate. Uh, we also had a Daniels Fund Award Scholarship Award recipient this year. That's one of our seniors there. If you come to our concert, you will hear him on the keyboard, on the guitar. Like he plays a little bit of everything. He is a very well-rounded um, person. Like he's remarkable. So that was amazing to have a Daniels Scholar. Uh, the picture to the right there, that's a picture of seniors working with our kinder and first graders. They were doing farm to, farm to the table activities. And I think they were doing some stuff with, with making things with eggs that day. And so that's like an example of elementary coming together with secondary and doing some work that way. Uh, one of the special things that we do for any state competition, any team that qualifies for state, we do a send off. And so the picture in the bottom right, that's our girls as they were going on their send off onto the bus. We play, we will rock you over the loudspeaker and we line the halls and high five everybody on their way out. And uh, we actually did that for two of our little wrestlers that were in the wrestling state tournament a couple of weeks ago, we had a third grader and a kindergartner, I think, or yeah, kindergartner that went to that and they got to run through the halls and they thought that was pretty cool. And then that's a picture, I think, at, at regionals for our volleyball team. Now, one of the things that, <laughs> you know, when you guys said, share something a little unique about your school, 
it's a different world out there for us sometimes. And so a lot of times, you know, we get up in the morning, we look out the window and it might not be doing anything here, but you hit Bosler and there's like an imaginary line where just something else is going on. And so our two snow days that we had in February, Randy was out on the road and he called and he said, yeah, these roads, these aren't great, Stacy. Have you talked to anybody out there? And I said, I'll, I'll text a few people and I'll call some people. And so I called up Ms. Valier, for those of you that know Kelly Valier. I said, Kelly, what's it doing out there? And she said, Stacy, it's bad. And I said, is it? And she goes, I can't see my barn. I said, Kelly, I don't know what that means. <laughs> so the next thing she sends is a picture, that one on the left. And I'm like, I don't know where your barn's supposed to be, Kelly. Like, help me out here. And she's like, you should see the barn right there. And I can't see the barn. And I was like, Randy, she can't see her barn. I think we should go virtual today. <laughs> Um, so that was a day and it really did drift up pretty bad. Um, and then later on, uh, Dally, Ms. Bowers, she says, I'll drive over to the school. I'll, I'll take pictures just in case people are wondering she gets stuck. So then she's texting me, I'm stuck. And I'm like, oh, please don't drive anymore. But as you can see in that picture in the top, right, that far right picture, you can see where like the door handles are and how far it was up against the doors. And so that's kind of the before and the after of that storm. We had some pretty impressive drifts out there and it was not passable. And so luckily we had prepared for that and we had the kids ready to go. We, we got in front of it and said, Hey, we've got a bunch of work. If we need to go virtual, we'll let you know in the morning. And we were able to go virtual and have our two school days successfully. So when Kelly says she can't see the barn, it's bad. <laughs> and here's a little. A little taste of, of what you might see. This is this is just a small snippet of our spring concert and, and what you'll hear. You'll hear the the Daniels fund winner, Simeon. He you can't really see him. He's on the left, but he's on the keyboard as they, they sing Great Balls of Fire. It's kind of fun. You hear the crowd just go crazy. It was a fun concert. So we hope you all can make it on, on Thursday. It's at 530. It'll be in our gym. When we do K-12, we pack the, the gym, let alone the auditorium. We don't have enough room in the auditorium for our concerts. So thank you for your time. And I guess if you have any questions, I could answer questions. I just remind the board that on the 18th is our site visit. I'm on. On the 18th is our site visit, 11 o'clock. And if any, we may carpool if we need to. It's a, not as, a little longer drive than going over to the high, the high school here. And it is, uh, this is Sean's favorite meal out there. It's the chicken and mashed potatoes and gravy meal, which is one of the best meals out there. And so our lunch staff, it is $4 if you're going to buy a school lunch out there, but um, is well worth it. It's good. It is really good. Any questions? Dr. Goldhart, would there be a bus available to go or will people just drive yeah. out? Yeah. I'll talk to Mr. Wilkinson about that and see if maybe he could drive us so that we're extra safe. Yeah, or, or <laughs> suburban or something. Okay. <laughs> I'll let you know if we can see the barn. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Christy Martin. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a few questions. One, I think you, you kind of answered already. When you talk about your enrollment is going up, are those mostly kids who are coming out from Laramie or are those people in the Rock River community who there's just more kids there? We did have a family that moved in to Rock River um, earlier this year, but it's typically people from Laramie. Yeah, okay. Um, you have a daycare. How does that work? You know, uh, Bailey got the certification for it a long time ago. What she did, 
what it, it's just a daycare within the building and she went through all of the process to get certified and be able to house it there. And I don't know what that all entailed, to be honest with you. Um, but she did that certification in a joint partnership. I think it was under Mr. Weigel at the time, way back. But I really don't, Is it for I don't know. Teachers, kids? And locals. And locals. There's locals okay. that, that bring their, their kids by. I think, I mean, that's an ongoing challenge that I think teachers in the rest of our district have. And so yeah, it's go. been very nice for teachers yeah. that we, that had that at their, right there for them. Um, so that's, that has been nice to have that there. Cool. How long we'll have it? I don't know. Oh. Because I, well, right now, Ms. Valier, that was, she facilitates it. She's also a paraprofessional for us. Mm -hmm. And then her kids are going to be school age, so. Okay. And well, we might come out and ask you some questions if we try to. I'll just connect you with anyway. her because she can okay. answer She'll all those. The She'll yes. have the answers. Um, you know, when we talk about the possibility of doing four day weeks here, you know, one of the things that we always hear is like, ah, oh, well, parents are going to be super upset because there's no place for their kids to go on Friday. Is that something that you all have had to deal with doing a four day week? We have not. And actually, part of the process, you have to have public meetings about the four day week for input. And it's all been positive in, in the two years that I, this, this was the second year I had to do that proposal. And the input that we've gotten from families, it, it, they like it. Um, they prefer it for making appointments on Fridays. Uh, we have families that say it's really nice because I can leave my job at noon and then the family can go on a vacation a little bit earlier. We, in the two times that I've done it, I have not received any negative feedback on it. Does the school offer any kind of support for kids who whose parents both work and they just have nowhere to go, or is that we don't out there? No. Okay. Um, um, I'm people have I've talked before about my enthusiasm for outdoor education, the place based learning. You know, obviously, you all are part of a program that's sort of an incubator for that kind of thing. Um, I mean, is, are there lessons that you've learned or I mean, you know, I'm just trying to imagine how to like replicate that and expand it more into the the rest of the districts. I, I and, you know, listening to what you talk about with the increased engagement and kids are just eager to learn that way. That's basically what I've heard about this type of approach. And so I'm just interested if there's any thoughts on how we might adopt that at other schools other than Rock River. Um, it's my understanding that we have had somebody that's been working mm -hmm. with some of our elementary staff in town yep. for place based. Um, and I, I mean, it's like Jeff said, it's, it's not like a separate curriculum. It's, it's just a different approach. Right. And I think that, you know, how that could happen. We've had a lot of support from those Teton science coaches and, and a lot of assurance from them, like, Hey, this is how you could do this. And this is what that could look like. And so probably just time and, and PD would help our in-town yeah. folks. Um, is there anything else that like, you know, I don't know how closely you follow board conversations, but, you know, being a, a bit of a different school from the rest of the schools that we have in the district, is there anything that we need to consider, you know, that would be helpful for your situation and your job that we're kind of glossing over or not talking about? Um, I, I don't, Nothing, you know, really glaring. I, I think it's easy sometimes to forget about us, mm -hmm. but at the same time, like I understand that, you know, because we are off the beaten path a little bit, but I think that just when we, you know, come to those things and I, and I've tried to be better about inviting you guys this year too, so that, you know, I, it's easy to not know if something's going on. And so I've been trying to make sure you guys get invitations so that you, you know, oh yeah, that's going on. I'd like to go. And um, just come out and visit and and pop over. I think our staff really appreciates that, and and celebrate those good things with us that that we see. And acknowledgement there would go a long way. Um, and I think that that's you know just something to keep in mind. It, it we are very small, but with that we're very intentional. And I think that that's what makes us pretty special out there. Any further questions? I would say, um, Principal Anfinson, that I've always been a fan of the looping where a teacher has kids for two years. When it works, it's one of the most remarkable things that can happen to a kid. 
and sometimes a teacher as well. Have you had a good experience with, with putting the grade levels together? Um, has that been a positive experience for everyone? I see you have first, second, third, fourth. So it's K-1. No, it's, yeah. yeah. So it's funny, like our second and third graders, those third graders have been with Ms. Bowers now for three years. So they're ready probably to get rid. Some are probably ready to get rid. And then others are going, what, I have to go on? And, you know, it's kind of funny. But it it works well. It does work well when they have that home base for two years in a row. This is the first year of the K-1, 2, 3 in a while. They've done it before, but it's been a long time. And so I think what we'll see next year, it will be a positive thing for, for those, those third graders that are going to go on to Miss Valier. They'll, they'll get to experience something different. And then for those, those second graders that are coming back in third grade, that's a very pivotal year where things change a lot in curriculum. And it's going to be very helpful that they have Ms. Bowers again for a second year. So I think it's been very positive. And I think for our kindergarten, first grade teacher, Ms. Nichols has um, enjoyed and embraced the challenge this year. She had kindergarten on an island for a while. And um, when she said she was ready to try K-1, she took it head on and it, she's wore out. <laughs> Any other discussion or questions? I just want to add, Mr. Chairman, how, how, great the school is there is such a positive culture in this building um it was the floor, the very first school i visited where the faculty started out the school year and they were so much fun and you could just feel the energy and in our in our uh, district wide principal meetings uh principal Affidson is a great contributor her colleagues have such great respect for her and our other schools here in town know everything about Rock River and whether they want to hear it or not, <laughs> you know, she's going to let them know and has been a real uh, great influencer for all of our leaders in the district. And I really appreciate what she's doing out there. Uh, my community office hours group with this group was probably one of my very favorite because this group was so <laughs> They're just such good people. And the, the spirit of happiness and meeting the famous substitute teacher who taught there for all the years who came, although she has no real connection there. She wanted to make sure she met me and let me know about Rock River. And it, it was incredible. It is such a great place. It's worth the drive. And you will enjoy it so much when you're out there. And I get the biggest kick out of seeing these big seniors and these little first graders just all walking around like it's no big deal. It's just kind of like what we do. It's like a big little house on the prairie. Mm -hmm. kind of Although we've got to get rid of that red tile on we the do. outside and change to it to blue. It does. It needs to be blue. <laughs> It was the night, it was the eighties. It was the, everything was red and orange. It was the eighties. Well, thank you so much again for such short notice. You did us a, a, a huge favor and what a great job. Thank you so much for everything yeah. you're all doing. Thank you guys. Thanks to Ms. Kunkel for sticking around too. She was the only one in the crowd and, and okay, Ms. Miss, Miss Lennon. <laughs> thank you. Well, the much anticipated budget update number five, Dr. Goldhart, can we start with you? Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <Such> excitement. <laughs> I'll start off with the insurance question that uh, Trustee Stanton brought up. One of the reasons that that incentive was put in that area is that we also have, there's, there's lots of competing interests where you have so a lot of our classified employees that have their pay rate isn't high, but they have insurance and they're, they're counting on that. And we want them to use that benefit. And then we've also found that we have a very large percentage of single teachers in our district and employees that are single. And one of the, the concerns we hear from our single employees is, are we subsidizing all of the other big plans where there's a family coverage. And we had to weigh that back and forth. And so we wanted to at least have one benefit that a single employee could get 
without cost uh, because a lot of these single employees are just right out of school and it gives them that opportunity, but it's something we can relook at. It's not in stone and it's definitely uh, something else we can see if there's other ways of, of working around that. So I want you to know that because next week uh, we will be before you with our recommendation for the rates because it is open enrollment month and our folks need to know, you know what they're going to do. Uh, as far as budget issues are concerned, I'm going to sh <clears throat> share some things tonight that I'm hoping won't be uh, taken badly. And I just have to, I just think we need to be open and honest about some issues. The first one is regarding the fiscal year 23 budget. While the district, uh, just so you, this background, while the district had a $1 million cut in state funding for fiscal year 23, there was no reduction at all in overall FTE in the district to match that. In fact, as we've researched it, as I re researched it with Jesse, there was actually an increase of one position overall. And so the bump, the, the difficulty this year would have been far less if we would have, if there would have been a cut then so that it wasn't as bad here to, to match our enrollment. And by not reducing FTE to align with enrollment, it didn't give the district the savings it needed to align with the funding reduction. And the fiscal year 23 budget, it was miscalculated. It miscalculated the amount of funds that were to go to charter schools uh, based on state requirements, because we're just a pass-through. We have no choice in that matter. And we can't cut those funds that are allotted to charters as savings for our budget. And unfortunately that was there and we had to readjust for that because they're, they're entitled to that. Uh, the pay increases for administration, staff, teachers uh, were not calculated correctly and cost much more than predicted. All of these budget miscalculations will end up causing the current budget to go over budget. And the board will need to approve an emergency allocation from the reserve fund to make up for this overage in June. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Goldhart. We need to approve an emergency appropriation from the reserve for what was appropriated previously. Is that correct? correct? Okay. So not we're not talking about making another appropriation. From the reserve. No, it's okay. it's to cover for the shortfall okay. in fiscal 23. Yeah. Okay. And looking at because by law we're not allowed to have a deficit. Correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure yes. that we're talking about back back what's already been done. And while I'm grateful we have those funds, and I don't know the total number yet, but it is uh it's one where your your mouth will drop a bit <laughs> because it's not not good. And what it does also is coming from the emerge from the um, reserve fund. We need to be reminded that this puts the reserve fund at a concerning level because it impacts our liquidity in paying bills, salary, and et cetera that are later reimbursed by the state. So, like transportation costs that we get reimbursed, special education costs that we get reimbursed, summer payroll that goes out before we get our money from the state. And I, I don't want to make this sound bad, but I just want to make it publicly known that although my name is on the fiscal year 23 budget as a superintendent, you know, I'd been here for 12 days. <laughs> that budget was presented. I had absolutely nothing to do with that budget. However, it has taken me nearly 10 months to almost figure out all the problems fully with the 23 budget and the impact it's had. Uh, I have to look at the great philosopher who I know Mr. Moore likes, Captain Jack Sparrow, uh, who reminds us that the problem is not the problem, the problem is our attitude about the problem, which is why I ultimately own the problem. And I wanna assure this board that my whole objective is to resolve the problem as painful as it's going to be. It has to be resolved. I, I will not allow it to just be kicked away. It has to be resolved. And it's also a really valuable lesson 
about what I what I say staying in our lane as it relates to our positions. Accountants should design budgets with our input because they know the rules and impacts of budgeting. Uh, those of us who are not accountants really should not be doing the nitty gritty work of a nitty gritty work of a budget. It's not a good idea. But we will prevail. I'm sure of that. And we will make up, we will continue to do, get this taken care of. Also, I let you know in your last board note that Lou Beecham is going to be coming to us on May 11th and is willing to stay with us through August if needed and will serve as our acting uh, chief financial officer during that time. She is a retired business manager who is very respected across the state and at the state level, knows Wyoming, Wyoming finance very well, and happens to have kids that live here and was quite excited about coming to be here. And so I'm looking forward to that and will help us and we'll start coming to the meetings and, and giving you, because her background information will help in that regard. Uh, the fiscal 24 budget. You should be receiving a draft proposal, hopefully in the next week, if all goes well. Uh, just so you know, we have had 16 retirements or resignations that we have not replaced to help us with this budget. So with attrition, we counted it up today. And we also need to remember that the cost of the step increase that was taken from reserves now has to be shifted to the general fund. and. I remember that the additional reductions in enrollment decreases our funding from the state. And then to add salt to the wound, the 13.5% increase to our health insurance. And so that bottom line for us is we cannot continue to be staffed for a higher enrollment that we do not have, as hard as that is. And we need our staffing to align with our enrollment we do have. And it is a painful process. None of us like doing it. I, in particular, do not like doing it. I prefer hiring more people rather than letting people go. But we cannot continue to pay for that. And we have to keep that aligned so that we do have the funds that are available to pay our folks more, to cover more insurance costs, and to really look at what we need, and as it aligns as we finish our strategic plan, is this aligned to what we want to see happen in our district over the next five years? Does this align to the learning we want to see happen over the next five years? But again, I want to assure the board that I don't like the word budget crisis. It's instead an enrollment issue and an alignment of our enrollment to our FTE, that's the problem. And we have to just take the painful walk of knowing we can't keep status quo in our FTE allotments. And it does affect everybody, but at the same time, the impacts are far more negative if we're in the hole, because then it hurts everybody. And so that's where we are. I'll be honest with you, it hasn't been the most enjoyable month of my career, but it's what we do. And it's what we need to do. And I know that Mr. Spann and this finance committee have really dug in. And I just want to send a shout out to these three members of that committee who have taken this on like wholeheartedly and have been uh, willing to have those tough conversations. And I know we'll share more as, as the, the board as a whole starts getting involved uh, with the budget. Uh, we're, we're behind. You should have had a draft proposal earlier. However, the good news is we kept our S&P rating. That's great news. The other good news is the fiscal 21 audit is pretty much done. Just needs to go through the final process and then it would present it to you. And the fiscal 22 audit should be done uh, hopefully before summer is over. And then we're going to at least be where we ought to be in that regard. So it's nice that within two years, we got two past years audits done and are, are getting this budget worked out. 
And I've been really pleased overall with the employees in the district who've been very understanding. They don't want to do this either. But overall, their response has been very gracious and very understanding. And it makes me feel bad that they have to feel the hurt because I don't want that to happen. But at the same time, they have been incredible. And I appreciate the professionalism of our staff. They are great people who make an incredible difference in the lives of our kids every single day. And if I had my way, they'd get a $20,000 raise, but I, I don't have my way. Um, but that's where we are. I don't got any questions on that. I'm not as articulate about this as the accountants, but it is kind of a summary there. I have a question. Trustee Siegel's dad. Um, I, I really appreciate the work of the finance committee. I'm sure you all are, are looking at questions that I don't even know how to ask. So I really appreciate that work and I'm interested to see what, what things look like when they come to us. So I'm gonna ask a question that may well be discussed, have been discussed. I'm just curious as we're looking at enrollment and full-time employees, have we looked at how we're using positions around the district and ratios of staff to students, like a position control report, has that been part of this and making sure we're maximizing the full-time employees we have? Absolutely, and in fact, it goes along with this. Uh, Mrs. Fisher and I are in the process of finalizing to get a, a true curriculum audit of our whole secondary system, because we need to know really what content is absolutely vital for our students, that core knowledge that every single student should have access to and learn. That, that's really nice to have, and that that we shouldn't have, or there's not a need for, and then also looking at how we align our staffing uh, so that it's on a ratio basis on FTE, not just a, some amount. So for example, some of our elementary schools may actually have kind of a higher staff average, like a teacher to uh, student ratio than some in, in our secondary. And it always should be the other way around. Uh, secondary can handle more. Elementary, you cannot, especially K-3. Those are vital. And during those literacy years, and we need to look at that and say, is this equitable? And also look at time equity. You know, are our elementary teachers getting equitable time with planning compared to other parts of the district? Um, what about our class sizes? Should we be running classes of five or six students? Is that necessary? Does it absolutely have to happen because of a certain course? Or is there a way to combine courses for that to happen? And so that map is out there so you know. And looking at better use of positions, because what we want to see is that the positions are used to have the most dramatic impact on children. And some are really nice, but in the long run, are they having the impact on student learning? And so that's a, value, a valuable part of this process is to really take a really hard look at that and have those important discussions as a community and as a board uh, to make sure we're doing that. And it's not easy because there are certain things that people have great ownership of and feel really good about and have worked really hard at. And it's, it's, it's not fun to have to say, you know, this is a nice, not a need. But when the numbers don't add up, they don't add up. And I think that's an excellent question. Excellent. Trustee Martin. Yeah, and fo following up on that, Dr. Goldhart, um, we'd, we'd been chatting about getting an updated position control report just so the board can look at it um, as we're making some of these decisions. And I, I brought this up in our finance committee before, just before this, and I had to mention like, you know, something that a situation I was aware of, they were like, oh, yeah, well, that was actually, this teacher's going to actually get shifted around. And so there's more, you know, the position control report doesn't explain all, you know, and I trust that the decisions are going to be informed 
by input coming up from the school level. They're going to be informed by best practices in education and, you know, guiding philosophies like, you know, keep the cuts away from the classroom and that kind of thing. But I think having that position control report that we can all just look at and say, oh, okay, here's a class with 12 kids in it or whatever um, would be beneficial, I think. We're happy to do that and update you with that. And we'll get that taken care of for you. Any other discussion? A couple of things come to mind for me is that um, we know that 10% is the standard for the reserve. Do you have any idea when we repair, fix and repair and, and move the monies forward <clears throat> approximately what level we could be at? I'm hoping we're at the 10% because there is probably more, a little more in there than we thought, but it's gonna be pretty tight. And I'll be giving some more recommendations as we look at finances, which would also include how to build that reserve back up. So we have the liquidity that we need, and it also helps our credit rating if we ever need to borrow to build. Also and for emergencies like this one. <laughs> you have it there. Also, two things come to mind. I, I had a chance to go back and look, and I know I'm about to commit a blasphemy here. When I request that, keep an open mind in the near future about the possibility of special meetings. We've had 40 special meetings in the last three and a half years. Almost half of them have taken place during the months of May, June, and July. For obvious reasons, we were hiring a superintendent last year. We have budgets. We have evaluations. We have a lot on our plate at that time. I'm not calling for a special session without the need for it, but be prepared for it because my estimation is we're about a month behind where we've been in the past. However, the state has also put us behind but we will have to allow for being shown two years ago's audit, a year's ago audit when it's finished, and this previous year's audit when it is finished. I just don't know that that's going to happen in the, in the regular course of scheduling. The other thing is, is I totally agree with let's not look. I, I'm not going to waste a minute of trying to figure out the wise and where force. However, we need to do a better job of training this board and future board members in the intricacies, if nothing else, the sheer vocabulary of the budget, because we don't understand it. And we have been put in the position of being absolutely beholding to the people that think they do. And that has put us in this spot. And I, I couldn't agree with you more to having an FCO that's knows what they're doing, has been there, done that, training as many people as possible so that if we have movement, it's not such a uh, an awful event for us. But we're going to need to do something there. Um, I'm going to cross over a line here that we have crossed over before, but I think it's appropriate to do. And I'm going to ask Mrs. Learn. Are we getting the word out about our condition? Are people understanding? And if not, um, I would ask for your input, what we can do to inform and help spread information that is necessary. We don't seem to have the press like we used to. Um, so what can we do? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would say that it's a little bit of, the boy who cried wolf scenario, because we have been hearing that we're on a budget cliff for the last seven years. Gonna have to fill, or we're gonna have to cut positions. We're going to have to make cuts. You're not going to be able to get a raise. We've been hearing this year after year after year at meet and confer. And then the attrition isn't enough to take care of it. And no action has been taken to correct and have our staffing match our ADM. 
So I think, first of all, the, the fact that we are going through some of those very painful steps right now is, is a mixed blessing, but it's, it's what's going to keep us from being here every year. And uh, I think that continuing to have um, a good working relationship with each staff group and having each staff group each employee group present at the same time at meet and confer is so important. And then having access for them to be able to communicate with their groups. We still don't have that access right now. I can't send an email to just all certified staff and reach all certified staff. Our paraeducators cannot send an email to all paraeducators. In fact, when, she, when um, one of the meet and confer paraeducator reps tried to do that at the beginning of the year to survey her group members, she thinks she reached 14 of them. We know there are far more paraeducators in the district than that. And so she was unable to actually accurately represent their concerns. That meet and confer process is a year long process for a reason. And um, we're grateful that it was instituted uh, um, again in January. And we hope that moving forward, it will continue in a way that creates proactive communication between employee groups, central office administration, and the board, having the board there and having them be part of those conversations is so important because they're able to actually understand what some of those things are. And then having the, the communication capability is really the missing piece right now. We're not able to communicate out to our groups. Yes, Pat sends a great email, but each group needs to be able to talk with their members and have those kinds of open conversations. Mr. Chair. I don't know why can't they why can't you all communicate? I'm um, there are not currently I mean this is a Google emails. group. I mean I I'm I'm part of professionally, I'm part of like six different coalitions and subcommittees, and it's a really easy thing to do. And I don't understand why we can't do that. I don't have access to all certified staff uh, listings. You can follow, and for a while, that's what we were doing because I was given access to create a, a group online. Um, but listserv, there's some dangers there in, in allowing people to get access to be able to send out emails to all staff. And I, I think Mr. Moore will want to um, weigh in about that. But I don't know who gets, who resigns all the time or maybe doesn't resign but no longer works for the district. Those kinds of things, I, that's a, a personnel issue that I don't have access to those. So I, I can't even do that for the certified group. I mean, I, and, I would, and, you know, I mean, I've been ringing the horn of like, we need to have a dedicated person in charge of communications, not just publicly, but also to in our own staff. And I'm disappointed that hasn't happened yet. But I mean, just the fact that we can't conquer basic technological things like this is really disturbing to me because I mean, that would, that's the obvious way to have a communication tier. Um, so I hope that that, I don't know what it takes to fix that, but I hope it gets fixed because, you know, we're up here to make, we're, nobody's here. We're having these important conversations and no one's listening, you know, and how are people going to know if we don't have someone dedicated to communicating with the staff and we don't have the technology for the staff com to communicate with themselves. And I'm not going to continue to be that that communication conduit, um, you know, from here on out. So I think that that will be another challenge. Um, I do think that Brian is up to that, but obviously we can't communicate to and for the entire district and all of those employee groups would tell you that you said that it, this has been going on for seven plus years. I would tell you that I started in this business in 1979 and it was alive and well then. I call it negotiation rhetoric mm -hmm. and it's catching up to us. It isn't catching up to it, it's, it's caught up to us. And your, your analogy of the cry wolf is right on the money. Um, and that's why I think it's, it's, it's time to change some things that we do, not wholesale, but some things that we do, because here we are in a legitimate situation um, caused by the perfect storm of events, but it is real. And I'm not getting the idea that, that many people don't feel like this too shall pass. I believe it will, but I think it's gonna take longer than most people believe. And so we are probably not getting the word out as well as we could, we administration, et cetera. Um, so 
ask people, we will, we will break and bend the rules if we have to, to get input like you have given us. We need concrete solutions and input for getting out this information because it will only help us when the ship is righted. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would just say, opening it up for public comment at a work session is a giant step in the right direction. I don't know why it went away, but it did. And at the work sessions, the, probably the first six years that I served um, in this kind of a role, there was conversation, there was dialogue, and there was um, employees were allowed to get up and give public comment. Somewhere along that line, the line, it got turned off and you could only get your three minutes at, a, at an actual board meeting once a month. And then there, there was no opportunity for dialogue. So I do think that that's helpful. And, and the, the analogy of the boy who cried wolf I think is exacerbated by the fact that every district along I-80, I guess as far as Green River, I don't know what Evanston is doing, they're all getting huge raises. They're all getting huge hits to the base to make sure that it covers the insurance increase because everybody did see large insurance increases across the board. We know that part of that is related to the, the floodgates being opened after COVID and needing to get those medical procedures done. But they're, they're getting huge raises, thousands, of dollars, $2,500 hit to the base plus a raise. And our employees are seeing that happening and wondering how on earth are we in such dire straits that we're going to be getting less every single month next year. So we've been doing our best to communicate that. And I just, I wanna take a really quick opportunity and correct myself on that insurance um, figures that I gave you, $7,000 for a family before your co-insurance kicks in on the, the high deductible plan. And your HSA limit next year will be seventy-seven fifty, not nine thousand. So I apologize for the um, for misspeaking, but that is still an incredible burden for all of our employees, and especially classified. I would tell you that a pet peeve of mine is not being able having experts in our audience, and and not perhaps having the skills or the knowledge of how to use them. So we're just going to call for it and bring it up. That's how it was done when I was in your shoes in another school district. Um, I truly believe we can't spend six to seven months of the year praising the virtues and the skill of our employees and then get into this animosity time of the year, which just coincides with the end of the year. And we wonder why everyone's wore out. It's, it's this tug of war. We, we were like this till Christmas. And now we're like, we don't, trust what others are saying if if it's not trusting what the board has to say we've earned that and we're going to have to earn it back um and so we'll do everything possible every sidebar conversation i've had with the people that are here um, want to use the experts that are available to us and they want to make this right so hopefully we'll show signs that we're doing that thank you for the opportunity and then i'll work with mr moore on the list service. thank you any other questions or discussion or concerns? We look forward to hearing anything you have for us on, on the budget, Mr. Trustee Martin. Yeah, I just, I mean, I want to echo your com your comment about, you know, the, the 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 degree of disengagement that this board had from the budget process previously, and how moving forward we have to change that as a culture. Like just that, I mean, that's, I've learned so much being on the finance committee this year. I'm just kind of blown away by my lack of knowledge previously. And I didn't know that we had an FTE last year. Um, that's to, the, given the conversation that we're having right now, that to me is stupefying. Mm -hmm. We added an FTE. You know, we, we were in the budget situation that we were in last year and we added a position. Um, you know, I mean, that, that rep, you know, accountants should be doing the budget, but, you know, the board should know better about. Well, and you, and you said it right, uh, Trustee Martin, that one of the main reasons I, I promoted these board committees and have them rotate is so that this board gets that background knowledge and understanding. Uh, those that have been on the finance committee this year have learned incredible skills and understanding of, of a public school budget. And in the future, as these rotate, other members of the board will then be able to get that. Well, another set of skills is learned 
so that it improves your capacity in your very, very important role because budget and policy are the two main areas of the board. And I agree that you cannot make an effective decision without the knowledge. And so I, I've spent my commitment that I want you to have more access and understanding of that process so that your decision making can be really clear. Okay, I understand why this is the deal and and then be able to give the feedback. And as far as the uh, draft budgets, we will be sending those out to the schools as well. And then having those conversations with school groups and getting feedback from every angle of that as, as much as we can before. And even while you're looking at it and then adding upon that so that we get those voices heard. Trustee Gosar, am I am I ignoring you? Are you are you okay with what? Okay, thank you. The reason I ask if if, if anyone's not sure is he is the chairman of the finance committee. I would say now, thank you so much for bringing these board subcommittees to our lives. This this finance committee couldn't have come at a better time in our history. That's for sure. Thank you. Any other questions, uh, Trustee Siegel, Stan? Do we know how these other districts are? doing these increases to the base? What's what's the magic formula? Because I assume that they're facing declining enrollment. I assume that they're facing the same budget formula that we're getting from Cheyenne. They've got, we gave a raise, la to be fair, we were the only district on the I-80 corridor last year to give a raise. Um, and that's, and that is why we did not receive additional information or funding from the legislature to do so. Remember, we made the decision to give a step increase out of the reserves. I remember. And, and now, and, and because we've done that, instead of giving a raise this year with the external cost adjustment that we were provided by the legislature, we're using that external cost adjustment to essentially backfill the raise that we gave last year. So we got the same, just so I understand, we got the same ECA these other districts did, but we're just paying for the raise that we did last year. All right. Plus other issues Plus like other issues. declining enrollment, other FTE positions, uh, where other districts were at, where their ADM matched their budgeting, we hadn't. And when you're in that position and you get the extra ECA, you do have more flexibility to then use it in the other areas. And as we get these audits back, there will be recommendations in them. There's just no doubt in my mind. But the problem is going to be, it's gonna take a couple of more budgets to fix them all because we won't get them in time, but we'll, we'll work them through. I think it'll take us about two plus years to really just wipe it to be where it's supposed to be. Would it be fair to say, if we were to give a description for those of you old enough to remember checkbooks, we wrote a check last year and we forgot to put it in the book. We put it in the book this year, but we continued on with spending. And that's, so we're behind, we're behind. The raises that we gave last year, if we had acknowledged them in a manner with several other things that we should have done, and that's as far as I'll go, is they weren't acknowledged. And now it's time we have to acknowledge, we have to pay it back. Yes, sir. Chair Sorensen, I think a good al analogy that I've shared with a lot of people is we paid our mortgage out of our emergency fund. That's not sustainable. So we have a, an ongoing bill that we have to pay and we have an ECA, that's sustainable. So. Like Trustee Martin said, yes, we started out ahead and did what a lot of school districts didn't do. And I think we did it at the right time with the greatest intention um, for our staff and employees at a time where inflation was really high. But yes, now that bill is due, we just can't continue to keep doing that. Thank you. Did that help? It, it did help. And I just want to, this is just difficult. And this is the responsibility that we've taken on. And I accept that. You know, it's just tough because, you know, inflation last year and then and then rents went up and now insurance has gone up. And I know from my home grocery bill, the inflation around groceries didn't go down. And I just want 
to let our employees know that we know that the housing market in Laramie didn't take a big sigh of relief as inflation backed off. Landlords increased their rents and continue to do so. And our employees are just getting squeezed in every direction. And we're seeing it in our inboxes. We're reading these emails. We know this is happening out there and we're going to do the best we can. I mean, I think, and then another piece of this is that we're part of a lawsuit against the legislature because they have been regularly underfunding public education for years. Any further discussion? Trustee Bruce. Yeah, Chair Sorensen, just to add to it, I'm going to build on what Dr. Goldhart said. There are other things as well. And your example of inflation is perfect. So for instance, as we planned the budget, last year when the budget was planned, the numbers for utilities were just stuck in from last year, not looking ahead thinking, oh, we might should raise this a little bit because utilities are going up. So we're sitting here now planning with last year's utility costs in the new budget. Well, how does that make sense? Another thing is we've been kind of running with enrollment at about 4,000. Well, suddenly it's about 3,800, but we're not realizing that we're kind of still planning as if it's 4,000. So these are the kind of things that 12 days in, Dr. Goldhart was looking at thinking, how did this happen? How did this kind of planning take place? There are quite a few things like that in the planning that weren't taken care of properly in addition to the mortgage that trustee goes are talking about. So these things have been really adding up to this. Now that we understand though, I think Kevin's S&P ratings came through. Any further discussion? Okay, maybe part of the solution is the next agenda, I don't Old Slate update, Dr. Goldhart, or do we go straight to Randy? We're gonna have Randy take okay. this when he's our pro. We talked about this earlier. Will this be put on where people can see it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll put it on the website. Thank you. And also just so the board is aware, the notices have been sent out to those neighbors of Slade for the public hearing that'll be next week's meeting so that they were informed. So Chairman Sorensen, trustees, as we go forward here, uh, you know, some things have changed since we last talked. I did get the estimates on abatement and demolition of the Slade Elementary. Uh, the rough order of magnitude on that is 515,400 to 644,400. That'd be put out to bid, but we had to have numbers if you decide that you want to demo this building that will uh, come into effect later down, later down the line. So we have that. So our next step would be a public meeting, which is uh, scheduled for the 10th next week. And then we go from that into our, uh, whether you approve the demolition, sell the property, whatever that means. That's why it says, if desired, I'm not making a recommendation or anything. I'm just, whatever you go, we will go forward with that. Um, after you make that decision, we'll send a request to Valerie Hughes over at the school facilities, uh, or at the SFD, uh, to be on the school facilities commission uh, planning agenda. That's how we would get money to uh, move forward with this. And what that takes is a letterhead from the superintendent with his signature of what we're, we wanna do, that we want to abate it, that we want to demo it. Um, we are requesting funds for demolition. We're requesting to offer the land or for sale or whatever you guys choose to do with that after abatement and demolition looking at unimproved property values. I tried getting you a number of what that might be. Uh, there is no consensus. Nobody wants to do anything unless we want to sign a contract with them to sell the property and uh, wasn't gonna enter into that at this time. So uh, we don't have a, a value. We have some guesstimates, but it's so far out there that uh, I don't want to venture on that. Uh, 
as we talked before, the building was acquired before the SFC was established, so it was paid for by Albany County School District. Uh, we are going to ask to keep all the proceeds from the land. Uh, that probably will not happen. What will probably happen is that uh, if we, whatever we do with that land, we would have to give the demolition cost back to the state. Uh, but we're going to ask the question. We're going to make them tell us no, right? Um, so we'll send these cost estimates that's up above with that. Um, I put abatement demolition on here twice. We'll have to have the minutes of the public meeting submitted with that. We have to have the board minutes saying what your guys' decision is. And then hopefully that will get us uh, on the meeting the 6th through the 8th up at uh, Buffalo, Wyoming. And Dr. Goldhart and myself, I believe, would go up to that and present this. At that time, uh, the SFC would be uh, putting a budget together to do it. We'd then do an RFP, uh, but with the with the school facilities department, award the contract, demolition, and then whatever we decide to do with the land. I would like to say this is a quick process, but it is not. Um, I would even hope for six months, but I don't even know if we'll see that. And then it all comes down with the state giving us the money to demo it also. Um, that's what I have. I also put on here the, the uh, statutes that uh, directs this. I thought you guys might want to go to that at some time and, and read through them. Uh, so they're there for you. That's where we get the information. I'm trying to share that information. So like we all said, so we all are going off the same uh, play sheet. Any questions? Trustee Gosar. Thanks, Mr. Thank Wilkinson. Um, Couple quick questions here, just on the abatement and of the dangerous materials. Do we know? I mean, I imagine that we're talking about asbestos. Is there anything else that we need to be? Yeah, most of the. So you you got lead pipes in a in a school that age. Um, you're going to have some uh, asbestos. You might have some items that uh, that they were talking about. Um, some mercury items that might be somewhere. I mean, they give you the whole gamut of what it is. We use Terracon here, so we know what's in our schools. We know that the foundation, the uh, the uh, underneath the ground where they on the crawl space where they put on the sealant is going to be asbestos. We know ceiling tiles that have not been removed or changed out is going to be asbestos. We know that some of the tile. If it's the original, would be asbestos. We know the items for the most part. And so when we are getting these, uh, you know, costs from uh, Terracon to kind of just give us a, a ballpark figure, that's kind of what we're going on. That's why there's kind of a, a dollar per square foot difference between what it could be and what they think it might be. Uh, and then we also took, when we did this, uh, the cost of Laramie High School, that was 2.3, 2 $2.4 million. We div divided Laramie High School 200 by four, and guess what? It came up to about the same price. So um, the difference is this is a one-story building, so that's the reason why even with as costs went up that we think we can do it for a lower price. Mr. Chairman, Trustee Martin. Um, I know that you can't, uh, Mr. Wilkerson, I, I know you, you know, we don't know how much we're going to be able to sell the lots for, but um, I mean, is there a ballpark price that, you know, if we're trying to do some back of the napkin math that we might look at? Uh, you, you know, we, we talked a little bit about this in, in that neighborhood, a, a 8,000 square foot lots can go somewhere 80 to 89,000 on the, on the regular market. You have to put, you know, we're not going to do the work. We don't have the money to do the work. So we're not going to put in the utilities. We're not going to do all that. So you got to back that up. You got to back up profit. So do you go 50 to $60 per square or per um, 50 to $60,000 per lot? Mm -hmm. You know, that's where we're kind of looking at. So we're looking at somewhere. Hopefully we could, you know, if we sold them, we'd net out, you know, a quarter of a billion dollars or better. Okay. But so, so a quarter of a million dollars ballpark that's a one-time payment so it wouldn't be that different from you know it's it's a it's not a regular thing that we're going to be able to balance the budget with and in addition this is not money that is going to come in anywhere close to on time to deal with the budget that we're looking at this year is that correct that would be correct thank you 
And then Trustee Martin, my recommendation to the board would be that we put that back in reserve if we're able to, so that we can keep that balance where it should be. But if we have emergencies we need to do, we could use it for that as well. Well, I, and I don't know if we're going to open it up for discussion right now, but um, or, or should we let, should we let Mr. Wilkerson off the hook or first, or are we going to keep him up there just in case? I'm good, Trustee Martin. Go ahead. If you have, if you have questions, Trustee Murthy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had a question about that back of the napkin estimate um, because the cost to demolition is significantly more. And were you saying we'd have to pay the state back for that, or can you just clarify? Yeah, no. So, so the uh, let, let's say. Um, we'll use $50,000 as a nice round figure. There's 17 lots in that. So that'd be uh, $750,000. So we would sell it for $750,000. And I'm believing that the state would make us pay back that, you know, five hundred and fifteen dollars to 644000 So we would keep the difference. We're going to ask to keep that whole thing. But... We will not lose money. We cannot lose money on this. If we if we get rid of the land and it's not worth what it is, the state's still paying for the for the demolition of that. Trustee Martin, did you have another question? Uh, no, I, I have a comment, and I yeah, uh, but not a question. Um, yeah, I'm one of the problems that we're dealing with inflation is the rising cost of housing here. And I think that we have an opportunity with this land to potentially in a significant way um, help remediate that um, for, for, for our educators, for ACSD staff, um, and for the city at large. You know, I just came back from the Wyoming School Board Association Board of Directors meeting and around the state, you know, districts are facing problems, hiring teachers, keeping teachers because they can't afford to live in these places. And so there are a lot of districts that are talking about building their own housing. Um, I'm not suggesting that we do that, but I did have a very compelling conversation with um, the person who designed the affordable housing program in Teton County. And she told me all about how they run a deed restricted housing program. Um, I would submit that we should seriously consider the prospect of swapping this land with the city for some land that is more desirable. And I believe that there is land that the city owns that the school district has at least expressed interest in um, so that the city could proceed to um, do what's called deed restrict a deed restriction in developing this land where they essentially give the land, sell the land for a dollar to a developer under the conditions that that developer builds affordable housing or a certain level of affordable housing, the developer gets to net the profit from selling the houses. The city assures that affordable housing is increased. Um, it's a win-win situation. We wouldn't have extra money to put back into the reserves, um, but we could have a, a, a piece of land from the city that um, that that work, that fits into our longer term plan. Um, and I know that there are members of the city council who are interested in this prospect. And so before we race off to pocket the quick cash, um, I hope that we might consider that this is a potentially a important opportunity to address the the cost of housing problem that affects the city and our school district. Mr. Chairman, and to Trustee Martin's point, I, I'm in conversation right now with um, Dr. Chapman, the superintendent of Teton County, uh, because she and I have been sitting by each other in the task force meetings. And she told me about their housing that they've been able to get. And so I've been picking her brain to find out the process because we do have other land too that we need to, it's something that's always been on the back of my mind that that could be an additional benefit that could be provided for employees is not paying as much in rent, but how do we manage the facility? How do you fund? You know, and it's usually a public-private type of a partnership. There's a lot of steps to it. 
but it's made a big difference for that district because as you know, Jackson isn't really a teacher, even teacher administrator wage community. <laughs> and so you have to find some ways to make that work. But and I get and other districts are talking about building their own housing. I'm not even proposing that we do that. I think that I think that we could basically, you know, swap this land with the city. The city could do a deed restriction public private partnership with the developer, and we wouldn't, you know, we'd be contributing to the solution. We wouldn't be losing anything. Um, and and we wouldn't have to be become a landlord either, you know. Um but that's, I mean, uh, and I don't know when when this final decision has to be made. Um, you know, if anybody else is interested in having conversations about with you know city councilors or how this works, or the the woman who does the affordable housing deed restrictions up in Teton County is offered to speak to the board. Um, you know, I don't know. I just I would put that forth for folks con to consider. Trustee Bruce, Chairman Sorensen. Mr. Wilkinson, do we have to be in charge of the demolition? I mean, if we are talking about changing up and switching and talking to say, I mean, do we have to do the demolition or could we just sell it to somebody or trade it to somebody without us handling? And thank you for all this work that you've done. Uh, Chairman Sorensen, uh, Trustee Bruce, you know, we, we discuss this with people trying to, that's what took us so long to get to this. And everybody's like, you know, we, we got to move at some time. We had zero input of people who wanted. I mean, they don't want to take on the de the demolition of it. I mean, I, I think the land is worth more to us once that is gone. Uh, I would also venture to guess that many people know how the state of Wyoming works with their demolition of school buildings. And so they know that this can be taken care of. I'm just guessing that. But I, I think that might have some to do with it just from talk I've heard. And then I'd add my other big concern is, as I mentioned before, this building has been broken into already a couple of times. And that'll continue to happen. And you'll start to see defacing and some vandalism. And I don't want it to become a, a problem in the neighborhood for those individuals who live there. And that's their home. And the safety factors, because we'd ultimately be held liable, even though we're not, we're trying to keep people out. And that's one of the bigger issues. And I think we would get better. We'd have more exposure and willingness to get the land with the building off because of all of the issues of demolishing a very old building that has potentially hazardous, you know, issues that need to be abated. Could we just market it as like retro or classic yes. on like eight or B and B or something like that? Because I do like that building. I do like it. But boy, it's it's an expensive one. You'd have to redo pretty much everything. But it is retro. You are right. Mid-century, <laughs> modern. Uh, Trustee Gosar. Chair Sorensen, uh, Mr. Wilkinson. So just to correct me if I'm wrong, I just looked at this date. You said if desired on May 10th, that'd be next board meeting, correct? And, uh, then, and that would just be a timeline to get to the June 6th SFC meeting. Is that a is that a monthly meeting that they have, or is that an annual meeting that you're talking about for SFC? Uh, or SFD, I'm sorry. Yep, uh, Chairman Sorensen, uh, Trustee Gosar. Uh, this is the, we, we lucked out actually, sort of. This is the budget meeting for this. This is where they'll give money. Uh, I believe the budget meeting is only every every June. I, I will I will check for sure on that. But it was, uh, Valerie Hughes with the uh, SFD said this was the meeting we had to be at if we wanted to get it done this year. Okay, so then we would be a, another whole year if we miss that deadline or miss that opportunity, then we'd have a whole nother year to discuss, but nothing's really going to happen. We could, you know, inch along, but nothing's really going to happen. That is correct. I will verify that tomorrow and I will send you all an email to verify that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Trustee Martin. Uh, Mr. Wilkerson, could we vote to demolish the property and 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 have that be our, and have that be the motion? And, uh, you know, and not make a formal commitment to what we're going to do with the property after it's demolished? Or would we have to, as this says, 
approve the demolition and sale of the property. My understanding was there'd have to be something in there said that could potentially be sold because if the board did decide to sell it and it wasn't part of that motion, you couldn't until there was another vote saying so and goes through that process. So it could be something of the potential of this, this, or this, maybe another op would be another option to give you that option. So I will also ask a, a misuse on that also, uh, what sale means, could that be a trade? Could that be a sale, a swap of land? I'll get those two uh, questions answered tomorrow morning. Uh, and then I will let you all know. Trustee Martin, may I may I ask a question um, of you? Were you asking if we have to have a motion that includes sale to even get to the meeting of the SFD? That's what I'm asking. Okay. okay. Uh, Trustee Sorensen, we we could just do the demolition, but then we would have to go back in front of the SFC again to ask for, to be able to sell it, just like uh, buying a piece of land, uh, unless the SFC approves it, we can't use those funds for that. Yeah, but I, I think what you said in terms of like seeing if what, what sell means, you know, yep. what our options are. Mr. Wilkerson, we have monthly expenses of which are probably gonna escalate dramatically here as we approach summer. Any kind of estimates about utilities and labor costs for keeping that um, property groomed, I guess? So we do get uh, labor costs for a small amount of groundskeepers for that building still. What we will have to pull out of our budgets for that school, and it's in the in the budget, is probably about somewhere between fourteen thousand, sixteen thousand dollars is what it'll cost to water that. Uh, I don't think the neighborhood. Uh, we we had this discussion in our uh, our uh, meeting with the finance committee. Uh, we we do have an option if you tell me not to water it, we let it go um, dormant in the community. If that would be the wish of the board thousand for the summer per month for, for the summer i'm okay. I'm sorry yeah it, it, it'll run somewhere between two thousand three thousand dollars a month depending on how much water we need for that got to remember that's a uh, uh what a five acre lot that we're we're keeping green uh we will uh yeah trustee siegel stanton is is it an option just to like mow it so it's not a huge eyesore, but not pour water on something that's going to get dug up in a month? Uh, Chairman Sorensen, Trustee uh, Stanton, yes. If you tell me that is your wish, I will do that. And uh, I, I just know the complaints we get um, when we have brown spots, let alone brown blocks. <laughs> Are we finished with are we finished with Mr. Wilkerson? We're gonna let you sit down, but you wanna plot on through? We have uh, No, Mr. Chair, can we have a five minute break? Please, please, please. Okay. Let's do it. Five minutes.
we have committee reports on here that we'll go through. Um, knowing that our time, I'm not asking you to cut back on time, but knowing um, what time it is. And I know how you, uh, I won't say you all, but I know how we are watching the time. So let's start off with the um, committee reports and let's start out with an appropriate one, Chairman Gosar with the Finance Committee. Yay. Chair Sorensen, thank you. Um, I think we've discussed that quite a bit of what we've been looking at. And, you know, I guess maybe one thing to add that uh, Dr. Goldhart had mentioned is, you know, not just this next budget cycle, but an ongoing budget that works for this district that, you know, we know that we've, you know, adequately looked and forecasted ahead that looks like it's a sustainable budget. But, uh, you know, like Trustee Bruce said, you know, there are some things definitely with utilities. I think, you know, one of the estimates was, you know, over 20% increase on utilities. So, you know, that's an awfully hard thing to, to balance or to budget for every single year. So hopefully we can find ways to reduce some of those costs, which I know Mr. Wilkinson has been, you know, talking to us about as well. So not much more to add than what we already discussed earlier tonight. Any other comments on the Finance Committee? Yeah, sorry, and I just want I just want to point out that we've been talking about this uh, having the administration kind of come to the board with a list of potential things because I mean we're looking at filling a hole, um, a size a sizable hole in the budget, and you know, and it's going to involve a, attrition and a number of things, um, and and so I think we can look forward to seeing that um, along with the position of control report. Um, and so that I think that's kind of the next stage and and bringing the entire board kind of more into the conversation about about the finance stuff. So um, that's that's all I have to add. Any other comments or discussion on the finance committee? Thank you so much for what you're all doing. And I reiterate this this committee couldn't have started at a better time. Thank you. Dr. Goldhart, do you have anything on policy and governance since our chairman Marshall, trustee Marshall is not here? We have two policies in the queue that we'll be bringing forward for first reading. The first one is in regard to kindergarten readiness, where we're proposing the policy be changed that uh, children are toilet trained before they are entering kindergarten. And the only exceptions would be for IEP students. Uh, where that's stated in the plan. The other one is a very short amendment to our policy on uh, freedom of information uh, requests, where we can charge what the employees the time to put in. But one thing we didn't have in there is legal fees when we have to have uh, things checked legally before so that it's not us absorbing that cost, but the person who's asking. And our legal counsel wrote that for us so that it's in there that way. I've also will be giving our committee uh, some proposals for my evaluation so that it's easier to understand and hopefully to, to rate for the group because that's coming up as well. And I'll be looking forward to that feedback. Thank you. Any other comments on the Policy and Governance Committee? Trustee Siegel Stanton. I'm so sorry. Also, you can just say Stanton. But, Stanton. Yeah. I was going to ask you afterwards. That's fine. Um, on that FOIA policy, just to understand, it's developing a way so that an employee who's asking for information would cover the cost of the time to the district to disclose the information. So I'm, I'm eager to learn more about this from the committee. I guess I just get nervous. We don't want to discourage our constituents from making sure that board procedure is being followed if they have concerns that we've been making policy backdoor, they should have they should feel free to ask about that without punishment. To get information. Yes, we just do it like we had one uh over the election process of our buildings that required a lot of time 
and researching, finding uh, what was needed. And then it had to be reviewed on top of that by legal counsel. So there was no showing of anybody that shouldn't be shown. And we had to pay that. And so it was just adding that to one of the costs that we can charge because it's minimal. Uh, we don't come out ahead by any means. It's just covering labor costs. And if they want paper, we charge for paper. Because there could be documents that are 600 pages. I mean, what kind of costs are we talking about? Well, the last one was, I don't know, $300 or $400 might have been in it. So I mean, my problem with that is that like we're not going to balance the budget no. on this $300, but that $300 can certainly discourage an employee or discourage a journalist or discourage a member of the public who is interested in finding out information about how public money is being used. Um, we had this conversation at the state legislature a few years ago where they decided they were going to start charging for public information and uh, the arguments against that were very compelling, I found. Um, so I, I don't know. This, the, this is a the policies, the policies in place, the only thing we're adding was the legal side. So adding costs, ad adding the cost of the legal review. If there has to be. Because 99.9% .9 of them don't need that and i've only had one where we've we've done the fee and they were quite frankly seemed surprised that it was as low as it was they were expecting more which i didn't expect that reaction but i don't know i know casey's been here a lot longer and how many she's seen but it's not a lot yeah. is easy to get is generally any of those requests i've had before i just say here it is do you want it emailed to you or do you want it on a flash drive Could we prove that it wasn't a deep fake? Any other questions? <laughs> As I go to teaching and learning, we had a conversation tonight about a meeting that I had with students at Laramie High School a month ago, the Youth Advocacy Council. And I had given them nine questions that I hope they could answer, but it was very apparent early in the meeting that it was better for everyone to just have a, a conversation. And so they kindly um, filled the answers to all of the questions and sent them to me on Monday. Um, I can forward those to you just so you can see uh, the, the questions were the origins of the club, how were they selected, who do they represent, how do they communicate or report back to students, what schools have are the students? What schools do they come from? Um, what do they see as their vision and mission? What are the topics? How are the topics and issues and areas of concern selected? Do they require training, professional development, um, and maybe we visit with them in the future? And so we, one of their uh, sponsors is Mr. Sliman. The other is Mr. Halsey. And I have to tell you. Um, this is a group that has recognized the need for coming to service. 
rather than someone who was voted each group has different responsibilities and a different vision. This group simply wants to be recognized as uh, be given a path for communication with us. They are not looking for a seat on the board. I can assure you of that. I also told them that the only thing that I would add to what they said and that this was a personal feeling that not only are we lacking in our communication, getting input from students, we are also lacking, in my opinion, with our employees and other adults of our community. And we would need to find venues for them. And that can be done if we choose simultaneously. So we may, we gave Mr. Sliman four or five questions to get answered before the next meeting. Um, what that path would look like. I don't remember all of them now, but we, we took off on that. If anyone wants to add, I thought it was a good conversation. It's just a general start getting information. And uh, before we come to the entire board with any kind of proposal, we gave him other questions, whether the demonstrative outreach efforts um, or plans that they have, um, what very clear board interface for ideas uh, would they, would we be talking about a work meeting? Policy examples, can they give us different models that are out there being used now? What about the Hope Squad? Does that fit in the overall um, picture, which is, which is an initiative that Dr. Goldhart uh, supports? We're also looking, perhaps this can be an offshoot or a start or an ancillary, maybe a subcommittee of a class on leadership that uh, Mr. George is interested in starting on the model of what they do at the middle school. So we were just in the initial talking points of how do we get student input? And bring that back to you when we have what we feel like are the answers to a lot of the questions we've heard so far. How about meet and confer? We're missing a lot of the people from meet and confer. So I'll refer to uh, Mr. James and Dr. Goldhart. I know Trustee Stanton's been at pretty much most of the meetings. So. Trustee Bruce should be on that list. This was just an off of the head list and, and we missed it. So we didn't take you off. And we'll give her a bye. She has had other items going on in her life. Uh, I'll just say, you know, it, this year, I think it's been a really healthy process. I think we reviewed how representation is chosen. I think there's been some really diligent efforts to understand what's going on with the budget, what's going on with health insurance, trying to include employee voice. Um, I did miss the last one I wasn't able to make. Um, but the next meet and confer will be this coming Monday. Monday. And uh, I wonder if we could find out if all four of us would be there. And if someone has to miss, would we offer that another board member could come just sit in, see the process? I don't have a problem with that. And I don't think the members of meet and confer have a problem with it. I thought the last meeting was really good. Uh, Jesse did an excellent presentation going over the insurance, why costs go up, the thinking behind all of it, and was very open and transparent about it. And the members there uh, asked great questions. I, it was one of those processes I was at first like, I don't know about this, but quite frankly, I've I've found it to be fine. I haven't had any issues with it, and I think we've had a good relationship with the group, and I want to keep that relationship positive. At board meeting, uh, our two members that represent us there are um, Trustee Marshall and Trustee Bear, who aren't here. So we'll we'll put that off. We also have several other committees that are meeting, and as they meet more in this next month, we'll make sure that they're on the next work meeting, the MLB, the medical leave bank, um, there's several others, so. 
we had put together, we had talked, and this came from a discussion from one of the trustees about the idea of having a shared calendar. And so they got together and, and Ms. Baldwin put it together. She's going to show you how to access it and what freedoms you have with it. And virtually any dates, I, I have no problems with any of you calling her and going, well, what about the Linford musical program? If you want something on there, she's going to show you how to do it, or she's going to show you who to talk to to do it. But um, anyway, thank you for doing that. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. On the far left hand side, you'll notice the icons. The top one is the mail, and then the second one is your calendar. You just click that one. did go through and add some events while you guys were meeting. So click on my calendars and then select the board calendar. You don't? Did you open the link that I shared with you? I sent an invite link um, last week. Okay, okay. <laughs> And I think I can reshare it. Are you seeing it? No. Did you did you get the email, Emily? Okay. I would go back to the email. Ta -da. Was it last weekend? It may have. I, last Rock Rivers was last weekend. Is this weekend? Yeah. So Widings was last weekend too. Yeah. So um, I heard you guys talking meet and confer is Monday the 8th, right? So to add, you just click on that date. It'll pull this window up. But if you click down in the bottom right, the more options, it'll give you a bigger window to just add more things in. So I'll just... I'm assuming it's at 345 like normal. Yeah. Okay. So I went to the event calendar that's on the district website. If you click on the calendar at the top toolbar on the district website, um, it pulls up 
all the different sites events. And I went to that calendar and then just copy them over to your calendar. So you don't have to try to sift through all of that. And also while she's putting that on, I think in last week's board report, I gave you the mixed up dates of Rock River. I did, a, I was mixing up everything. I gave you, I think the whiting on the wrong day and the Rock River on the wrong day, it was reversed. So ignore it. Correct. I had it the other way. A little different drive. <laughs> so Whiting's school visit or Whiting's okay okay on the 18th is Rock Rivers because your plan with that just a little information on it is that we seem to be asked from patrons each other and so forth when is this when is that and then you start the search and to be honest with you, sometimes it's, it's not easy to find the information that you're looking for. This is one attempt to have at least all the calendar types of items that you might have questions about all in one place. So let us know if it meets your needs. Oh, you know, I should probably put that on there. I, it's not on there. <laughs> so I will be sending out an email to you all asking who can attend that so that we can start because we actually assign people different categories for that. Um, and so be looking for that. It's just a, it'll take you two seconds to tell me yes or no that you're going to be able to attend and we'll go from there. That is on the 16th, correct? Thank you, Chair. I know I received an invitation that had an RSVP button from Casey already. Will that, will that meet the needs? Save, save you an email and having to juggle that through this. That makes the needs for me. I'll talk to you then. Is that who's coming? Okay. Yes, um, thank you. And while we're on that subject, we need to think about who's going to MC it. Who's going to be our MC and lead it? Just a thought. Someone needs to think about that. I will look for it because I was doing this going down the road. You know how I'm working on, on the text. I was going to pick on Nate because he's not able to attend. So I told him boo because I was going to have Nate MC. Yeah. While you're looking at that, I'm going to go ahead. We got two agenda items left. One is on board meeting review. And if I overheard, we're going to get a draft of the board agenda. We'll be sent to all of you to look at, or you'll get the notice that pull it's it up on. Right now, if you want to look on. at it. So, okay. Okay. And then uh, looking forward, any new agenda items that you want, down the road or looking at, we have pretty full agendas, but we also have lots of good ideas. So if you, if you have something, what you're learning right now came from this. So. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to yes. flag, and I emailed you about this. The Wyoming School Board Association is going to have to make a decision. Um, it's currently a member of both the National School Board Association and the Consortium of State School Board associations the new one um it's an untenable situation many people feel that way anyway um to be part of both and so the board is going to choose to be uh, part of one or the other um we're going to have a conversation about that i think prior to the june meeting so before just before our meeting in june the school board association board of directors is going to meet and kind of talk it out um, but if we can have a conversation about that and about what what our board's preference is um, so that I can bring that to the board of directors, um, I'd like to just, I'd like to do that. And also Trustee Martin, along with that, we did receive the bill for WSBA and I, I think I was not going to just pay it. I was going to hold off before that happened. I 
I've had one superintendent call me and said that their board has told her that if they pull out of WSBA that they'll quit W, I mean, if they pull out of NSBA that they're gonna quit WSBA. Right, and, and we can have a deeper conversation about that because if we do, if the w, if WSBA does choose to leave NSBA, individual school districts can Still engage belong. with NSBA um, from just straight from the district to the national, which people have different feelings about, you know? Um, but it's, and there's a lot of, just spoiler alert, a lot of dumb political stuff going on um but we can talk about it all at some point great what are your thoughts on having the discussion during the work meeting and if we're going to have a motion save that for the regular meeting rather than trying to do it all in one are we okay do you want that? the bill waited to wait for them too i think we probably okay. better uh I mean, I don't, as the um, area representative, I don't recommend pulling out of the Wyoming School Board Association. I just don't. You know, so I, I think paying the bill is fine, but that's just my opinion. So if we discuss it at the work meeting, first work meeting in June and have it as an agenda item, or can it just be an approval of the, I'd rather have it transparent exactly what we're doing because it could be part of the bill package that you pay our dues. But it seems like it's become such an item that perhaps it should be an agenda item to go either with it or we want out if these things happen. Folks, that's all I have. I... Do I want to look at the witch? Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped right over that. I know we spent a lot of time pulling any of the discussion items and things that did not have action out of that agenda into this one. And we will have an executive session. We have requested that our attorney be present as well. Oh, there were three of the five items that we thought needed to be, would be needed to be discussed. Everything was on consent, although the original said that the financial reports, we did pull that off consent. I just, I just don't feel that we're ready for that just yet. So financial reports will be done as we have done them as a separate, uh, they'll be presented. Um, fundraising, personnel, agendas, and minutes are all on the consent agenda. Fundraising, I'm sorry, donations. There was a third reading of one of the policies and there was a second reading of the one where we have to virtually verbatim follow the federal guidelines for what we need. Yes. Is, is discussion of the budget on here somewhere? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Budget updates. 
Um, and on the old slate, I saw that the listing included listing the property for sale. We can amend that according to whatever Randy comes yeah, up we'll with. Find out tomorrow. Okay. You all remember if that interview, do, do we miss a deadline for, no, okay. No. All right. I should call them and tell them we won't join unless they cut it in half the payment. Brian Farmer will laugh at me. We'll do a layaway plan. <laughs> We're anticipating executive session on matters of personnel litigation. We have a donor and it's in executive session. And to be honest with you, I don't know. We can't discuss an anonymous donor in executive session. There's no criteria that would allow us to do that from what we looked at. They just simply want to donate money and they want to remain anonymous. Um, I don't see any issue with that unless somebody wants to pull a donation or wants to know the name, but if we do that, we would probably have to do it in open session, which would probably lose us the donor, but there is no, we could not find a criteria to discuss a donation in executive session. All right. Just so the board knows on that one, it is a Rock River patron. Yeah, it's, it's not that an lives organization. In the community. Get on there. No, I can appreciate it. Um, I can. It is actually, yeah, putting the, thankfully. Put in the newspaper. <laughs> Christy Martin, did you have something? I'm just curious if we can, I mean, I don't mind having this little campfire huddle up you know it seems kind of quaint and intimate but like can we just get access to the agenda you know and have and just be able to see it prior to the work session so yes we don't have to have and you have to be logged in where you do your login. And actually, it has to be published tomorrow anyway, doesn't it? To meet the seven day. Consider the acceptance. I don't know. Actually, I'm going to go way out of the limb and just go, no. <laughs> Maybe Publishers Clearinghouse will have the name of the district instead of a person and get those out. It it's says here that we can consider the acceptance of gifts, donations, and bequests, which the donor has requested in writing to be kept confidential. Yeah, if we've met nice. those criteria, then we can, if somebody has a question. Um, we have heard that it's from a patron, and we know what it's for, so we'll see where it goes. But I would leave it there in executive session for now. Okay. 
Yes. Trustee do we, Murthy. Do we need to formally approve donations? Is that why it's on the agenda at all? Yes. Yeah. And okay. it's on the consent Approved agenda, but you have right. the ability to pull. Okay. Thank you. There's some history there, and um, I, I won't I won't hold up this meeting for the history, but there was some history there from last year, and that there was a donation that came in at a time we weren't sure who the donation was from. Yeah. Did everybody do their full tickets? Anything else about the agenda? I we have covered everything. I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you so much for your time.